it's really nice to see so many of you here. And, um, you know, I think you've probably been to similar sessions so far where I'll give a little bit of information, 25 minutes or so, I think is supposed to be about as much as, as, I, as I'm supposed to talk. And then we'll open up for questions. And any questions people have, hopefully you're comfortable asking in front of everybody. Um, and, you know, we'll have an open discussion. I'm obviously happy to answer questions afterwards as well. And I generally try to make myself as available as possible through the organization. So I'll get um, emails from, you know, Sue and the, and the staff on a pretty regular basis where somebody somewhere has some sort of question about something. And either I can try and help directly or, you know, speak with their, um, with their uh, clinical team. So, so this, is, this is sort of a, you know, executive summary overview slide. Ultimately, we're going to talk about everything on this slide. But just sort of as an overview, and, I, and I'm sure some of you in this room, you know, either are experiencing or have experienced or wondering about, you know, this condition. But, you know, first and foremost, the mouth involvement for GVHD is incredibly common. And oftentimes it can be a very prominent um, feature of just graft host disease overall. Um, and again, we're, we're primarily talking about chronic graft versus host disease. Um, I'm not going to talk about acute forms in, in this talk at all. If anyone has any questions, by all means, I'm, I'm happy to answer. But for the most part, it's not nearly as relevant and typically something that sort of comes and goes and doesn't become a long-term problem compared with the chronic form, which, again, I think many of you are well aware is something that can last for potentially, you know, many, many years. Um, there's a wide range of severity, so every single patient that has graft host disease in the mouth doesn't have the same condition. And even when it looks the same in one person versus another, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're suffering from the same degree of symptoms or not. Um, there's just a great amount of variability for reasons we don't understand very well. It's not necessarily that unique to graft host disease. There's other conditions that I see as an oral medicine specialist where you know, I see one patient and I need to treat them much more aggressively and I see another patient and I might think that this person would be in much worse condition and they're actually not complaining at all, in which case I sort of, you know, take my foot off the gas pedal because there's, there's no reason to treat it so aggressively. Um, the most common feature is what we call lichenoid inflammation and that's generally related to symptoms of mouth sensitivity. And again, I'll show pictures and I'll explain what all this is, but this is sort of the rash-like eruption that can develop in the mouth, typically with red and white changes. And it's, it's certainly the most prominent feature of graft host disease that's recognized by a patient or by a clinician. Um, but it can also affect the lips. And oftentimes it's initially thought that the lips are just sort of dry or getting chapped, but it can actually be a really a primary target of the graft host disease. And interestingly, for reasons that I, I and I don't think anyone can explain very well, the lips tend to be an extension of the mouth rather than sort of a component of the skin involvement. So it's someone may have very prominent involvement of the lips as well as mouth, but then the face really isn't affected. Other parts of the body might be, but not necessarily the face. Um, with when salivary gland, when the salivary glands are affected, so you have you know, these glands that for the most part you don't really think about, um, parotid, submandibular, sublingual, and you have minor salivary glands all throughout the mouth. These produce saliva, which we generally take for granted until we don't have enough saliva. Um, chronic graft host disease very frequently will affect the salivary glands. And so I sort of think of that as almost like the silent attack on the mouth because you can't really see it. The mouth doesn't even, doesn't even always look tremendously dry, despite the fact that the mouth can feel very dry. And in some cases, we actually see complications related to dryness changes before there have been any symptoms. And again, without getting too far ahead, um, we'll talk about that, but in particular, certain patterns of dental cavities um, and recurrent yeast infections in the mouth. And then the last thing we'll talk about, which by no means is what I want to be the take home for today's talk, and I don't want anyone not being able to go to sleep tonight or thinking, you know, what did I do or what can I do differently? But there is a significantly increased risk of mouth cancer in patients who have undergone uh, an allogeneic bone marrow or stem cell transplantation, and in particular with a history of chronic graft-versus-host disease, and in particular with a history of mouth chronic graft-versus-host disease. So I'll talk about that a little bit at the end, um, and I just, just want to sort of, you know, make that statement now that even when we talk about an increased risk, we're talking about a significantly increased risk to your, 
spouse, friend, partner, brother, sister, whoever, you know, who has not undergone a transplant, but still in the big picture, it's a very, very, very rare event. So when we talk about increased risk, this isn't an increased risk where it's a 50% chance that if you step into the street, you look both ways and take a step forward that the bus is going to hit you. Nothing like that. So this is, um, I'm not going to show you a whole lot of, you know, data and charts, but I think that this is a really nice um, figure that works for a group like you or a group of dentists or a group of physicians. And this, this is data from, you know, now nearly 20 years ago um, from Seattle, from the Fred Hutch uh, Cancer Research Center. And this, this is looking at um, the various presentations, areas of involvement in, um, in the body with, in patients with chronic graft-versus-host disease. And you can see that we go from high to low. And skin and mouth are the two most frequent approaching anywhere from, you know, 70 to 90 percent of patients who actually develop any form of chronic GVHD. So very common for the mouth to be affected. And we'll talk about, um, talk about these features first. So with, with the mouth, it's, it's, it's interesting that what we see with chronic graft versus host disease really resembles conditions that we otherwise see in the general population in patients who have not under, under, otherwise undergone a transplant. So as I'm sure all of you are well aware and some have probably experienced personally, you know, we have immune-mediated disorders, we have autoimmune disorders. I mean, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong with the body despite not having been treated for a type of cancer or, or you know, other um, hematologic problem. And so the, the rash-like changes essentially resemble almost exactly a condition that we see r routinely in oral medicine called oral lichen planus. Um, the, the clinical features are essentially exactly the same with maybe some tiny little nuance differences. When the salivary glands are affected, it essentially resembles a condition called Sjogren's syndrome, which is an autoimmune disease where the body essentially attacks the glands that, you know, supply the fluid to the, um, to the mouth and to the eyes. Uh, and then there's an autoimmune condition called scleroderma, or progressive systemic sclerosis. Um, again, not a common condition by any means, but still a condition that just develops spontaneously. And the condition where we see chronic graft-versus-host disease causing the tightening and thickening of, of, of the skin in particular, making movement difficult, um, is really almost identical to what we see in patients with scleroderma. So, it's as if all of these three conditions, in one way or another, can affect the mouth. Um, and again, these are conditions that we see in other situations. In most cases, the impact of chronic graft host disease in the mouth has to do with um, maintaining overall oral health and quality of life versus contributing to potentially an early death. Now, with that being said, obviously, if someone develops a, an aggressive mouth cancer, Unfortunately, that can potentially be, you know, a, a something that, that can be fatal. It's by no means something common and by no means anything that we think about and worry about on a daily basis. At the same time, when I talk about it later, there is reason why, of course, we at least want to be alerted to it um, so we don't miss a diagnosis when we should. Um, and the other important thing to keep in mind is with the mouth, oftentimes, even when we start with systemic therapy, so somebody might present with sort of, you know, new onset um, disease, as some of you are probably well aware, usually in the, you know, six to 12 months or so after transplant, maybe the, you know, liver enzymes come up, there's a full body rash, and the mouth is starting to become uncomfortable, the eyes are getting dry, the patient goes on prednisone, the liver, liver normalizes, the skin clears up, maybe it needs a little bit of topical treatment, and oftentimes the mouth just really doesn't change. Um, it's not to say that it never responds to systemic therapy, but it's not that uncommon that it ends up requiring sort of more attention than just, um, than just the, the, the general approach. Um, also, in many cases, the, the condition chronic graft host disease can be limited to the mouth, and so it's just in the mouth and nowhere else. And even if it's really bad in the mouth, if we can, we try to avoid using systemic treatment initially if, if we think we can get by without it. So, obviously points to a really important role for what we call ancillary care or types of like topical or localized treatments that we provide as, as specialists. Um, the next few slides are going to show clinical examples, but just so you can see what we're looking at here, you know, these are these typical red and white changes. 
They have these sort of um, lacy or reticular pattern. Sometimes the white changes sort of coalesce and almost look like a, um, like a plaque um, of white. And you can see the redness. So there's areas where it's at least, I think, pretty distinctly red compared with, for example, maybe back here where it looks a little bit more normal pink. And then this area here that has this somewhat irregular but otherwise well-defined sort of yellowish area, this is all what we refer to as ulceration. So this is basically where the, 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 the um, you know, that what we call the mucosa, the covering uh, lining surface, is basically completely denuded, um, similar to the way ulcerations can develop in the skin. So you get this sort of big open sort of raw sore. Um, these tend to be the most uncomfortable. So symptoms tend to be very uncomfortable when there's, when there's ulcers present. But again, I've had patients like this that tell me that they can eat, you know, hard crust pepperoni pizza and it doesn't make their eyes tear. And I have patients, <laughs> and I have patients like this where if you showed them a glass of orange juice, you know, they'd, they'd start crying because they just want to think about drinking it and they couldn't. So you can, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't determine a treatment plan just by looking in someone's mouth. And I'm always going to have taken a history before I look in the mouth anyways. Just some more examples. So here you can see, you know, first and foremost, it can affect anywhere in the mouth. So the cheeks and the tongue tend to be the most common, but it doesn't really matter what's most common. It can, it can be anywhere. Um, roof of the mouth is actually quite common as well, as are these little recurrent blisters that you can see here. We call them uh, superficial mucoceles. This is actually um, caused, caused by inflammation of minor salivary glands, which are all throughout the mouth, but particularly in the roof of the mouth. And generally, when they get stimulated and they're inflamed, they cause these little spit bubbles to form. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have experienced this. They tend to be more of a nuisance than painful, but in a very small subset of patients, they can actually be really, really uncomfortable. Um, but they tend to just come and go. Sometimes they respond to treatment. Sometimes they don't. They, t they tend to sort of burn out with time. Um, here you can see the involvement of prominent involvement of the lips, um, both in this case as well as in this case. And you can see that all those same features you see in the mouth can also be on the lips. So in this case, it looks just sort of very dry, but it's this, you know, very prominent white changes. Um, here, much more inflamed where it's actually broken down into ulcers on the lips as well, which, um, which can obviously be very uncomfortable. And just other examples of, you can see um, areas of ulceration, again, these areas that are yellow along the red and white. Um, and again, you know, very, very common pattern in the buccal mucosa. I like to include this, um, this actually sort of written quote. Um, so this was, a, this was one of the first really significant publications that described graft-first host disease in the mouth, going back to 1990. Um, and the first author, was really sort of the person that I think of as sort of the, I don't know, the father or grandfather of, of mouth graft versus disease. Somebody who really um, put a lot of time and effort into studying and, and understanding and, um, and becoming an expert in managing. And somebody actually is still a, a very good colleague of mine. He's, he's been in, in Seattle at the, at the Fred Hutch in the University of Washington uh, for his entire career. Um, I'll just read this out loud, but it really, it really sort of nails, nails home um, some of the, the key principles of this condition. So while oral lesions are most common in patients with extensive chronic graft disease, that means that it's more common for, to see mouth, skin, other areas. Uh, patients in our and other centers have been described who have limited disease involving only the oral cavity. In addition, we've noted that the oral cavity can be the site of persistent activity after the resolution of chronic graft-versus-host disease affecting other sites. And, you know, I see patients where it's sometimes only the mouth from the start, and that's really our focus of what we're managing. And I have patients who are 12, 15 years, 20 years out of transplant, and they have nothing else going on. They've been off of their immunosuppressive therapy for years. They're otherwise doing great, and the mouth just continues to be active. So. Um, there's, there's no absolute rhyme or reason. Obviously, there's outliers on either side, um, but you know, we can see just about anything. This slide, I think, um, is more helpful just you know, to have in the outline and you can sort of look through in more detail. Um, I think, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that this is a, a paper that you can actually download from PubMed for free um, at this point, um, I think. And if anyone really wanted it and they couldn't find it that way, if you communicate through the, through the organization, by all means, I'm happy to provide it. 
Um, but what I've done is sort of break down the disease into these sort of three separate conditions, so to speak, um, like we talked about. So talking about what are the signs and associated symptoms of the mucosal disease versus the salivary gland disease versus the sclerotic or sort of fibrotic disease. And again, in most cases, it's that problem of sensitivity, the mouth being uncomfortable, not tolerating certain foods that otherwise would be tolerated. Sometimes a sensation of tightness are, can all be associated with a mucosal disease. With salivary gland disease, it's much more dryness, um, mouth feeling you know, dry, sticky, um, difficult eating, difficulty swallowing, difficulty speaking, problems with dental cavities like we'll talk about. Um, but in some cases, the dry mouth symptoms can also cause sensitivity, very similar to the sensitivity caused by the rash-like changes. So there's a little bit of overlap there. And then finally, with the sclerotic disease, like I said, incredibly, incredibly rare, fortunately. Um, but we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail, sort of the ways in which it can affect the mouth. Um, and it's typically, you know, difficulty with opening, difficulty with being able to open widely, um, difficulty with being able to, you know, adequately, you know, brush the teeth or, you know, have dental care provided just because of the limitations in opening. So mucosal disease, we've talked about this a little bit. When we call something lichenoid, that's that sort of red and white pattern. Um, like we see here, we call this sort of lichenoid inflammation because it all refers back to this condition I referred to called lichen planus. Um, and it has typically these wet, white, red uh, changes and the ulcerations. Um, again, sensitivity is, is the sort of leading symptom. It's rare, I'm not gonna say impossible, because some patients do have some discomfort at rest, um, but not usually like disabling discomfort. It might be just a little bit of low grade discomfort. But with that being said, it's actually much more common that someone like this at rest would actually say my mouth doesn't hurt at all. But when they go to actually do something functionally, then it becomes very uncomfortable. Um, so something as simple as you know, brushing the teeth can actually become very difficult. Um, and we'll talk about you know, ways of managing that, but I can tell you now, you know, something as simple as just using a children's toothpaste generally will keep that problem from, uh, from being an issue. And then some cases limited mouth opening, and that's only because of the amount of that white change inside the mouth. So without getting too technical, it looks white because the, the tissue actually becomes thicker than normal. It's just a response to the inflammation. And so you can imagine if your arm was twice as thick with a thick coating over it, everything would just feel kind of tighter as you moved it, despite the fact that it's not actually fibrotic because it's something that with treatment will just go away. As far as management goes, our mainstay um, for management, unless we absolutely need systemic therapy, which you know, may be a consideration, is, is primarily topical corticosteroids. So we think you know, chronic graft disease can be treated with steroids. The skin is often treated with steroids. The eyes can be used, you know, we can use topical steroids. Mouth responds very well to topical steroids as well. Um, we generally use either gels or solutions. Solutions tend to work the best, especially when there's widespread involvement, like most people have, because the mouth works very well from a treatment standpoint. It's essentially a vessel. You can put a liquid in, keep your lips closed, swish it around, and you actually get very good um, contact delivery. Gels have a very good sort of penetration into the tissue. Um, so they can work well for sort of treating like one area here or there, but not for treating the entire mouth. But oftentimes what we'll do is, um, in, is, as I explained here with gauze, is for example, if we were, if we were trying to treat, you know, this patient with this ulcer, and they were already doing a rinse, and yet the ulcer was still causing significant symptoms, we might then use something like clobetazole gel, a very high potency topical steroid applied to gauze. So you put some on the gauze, and then basically put the gauze against the ulcer, let it sit there for another five or 10 minutes after doing the rinse, and it's basically a secondary treatment um, that just can sort of further help to get the, um, the inflammation down and potentially get the, the, area, the area healing. Um, with solutions, the, the, the key with using the solutions, as much as frequency, is the overall contact time. So we don't have good evidence that five minutes is a magic number, but we know that five minutes generally is correlated with, with a good response for most of the conditions we treat in oral medicine. 
if you treat someone for one minute versus five minutes, the difference can be remarkable. Um, three minutes versus five minutes, you know, we've never done studies. But so if someone can, can only get to three minutes, it's still going to be a lot better than 30 seconds or one minute. Um, and then the frequency is important too. So if maybe someone can only manage one minute, but they could do it six times during the day, um, that's probably pretty good delivery of the medicine. Um, dexamethasone, and some of you are probably familiar with this prescription, is what we use the most widely. And it's, it's essentially because it's a commercially available corticosteroid in solution form. None, nothing we use in oral medicine is actually intended to be used in the mouth. So we have to be creative with all the different um, available resources. And these solutions are intended to be swallowed. So it's actually important that, you know, the, the prescription is clear because if the physician just says, oh, I'll give you dexamethasone solution, and they enter it from their electronic health, you know, system, the, the prescription will go in as take by mouth. And I've had patients before that come back and they, they're doing great for whatever condition because they were given a prescription and not told to swish and spit. And we have to, you know, change that. The, um, these other two that I have listed here, clobetazole and budesonide, these are both higher potency topical steroids that sometimes I have to go to if dexamethasone isn't working effectively enough. Um, and these have to be compounded. That's why I have that in, in italics. Um, they're not commercially available otherwise in solution form. Um, topical tacrolimus. So tacrolimus is not a steroid, but it's another immunomodulatory agent. I'm sure you know many of you are familiar with it. It's called calcineurin inhibitor. Um, it is it can work very well for um, managing areas of the skin, works very well for the lips. We generally like to avoid using topical steroids on the lips, at least, at least for any you know, long periods of time, because it can actually cause um, irreversible changes and thinning and atrophy in the lips much, much, much more quickly than um, even other parts of the skin. It's why if any of you have had to treat your face with topical steroids, you know, generally it's, it's if you're using a high potency topical steroid, it's generally used somewhat sparingly um, sort of an on-off or together with, um, with something like protopic, topical tacrolimus. We can also have tacrolimus compounded. Um, so sometimes we use that as a solution as well. So if, I, if I've gone to one of those higher potency topical steroid solutions and I kind of still need to push a little bit further on the gas pedal, I can add topical tacrolimus and basically have those two solutions being used together at the same time, just like you might take more than one systemic immunosuppressive uh, agent. So these are actually, when I say combination, truly just mixing the two so that both agents are being delivered at the same time. Um, and then finally, in some cases, we'll use what we call intralesional steroid therapy. This is basically an injection of steroid into an area where there's one of these ulcers that just isn't healing, especially if it's an area that's really driving symptoms. And intralesional steroid therapy generally is very effective. I have a number of patients that I see every one or two months not necessarily for the rest of their lives, but during periods where it's active, and in some cases for a year, two years, where, you know, on top of their normal regimen, coming in and having various areas that just tend to pop up um, helps really control the disease in ways that we wouldn't be able to control otherwise. So these are a couple of examples of patients before and after treatment. Um, I think in both of these cases, these is roughly one month of treatment. So just, you know, rinsing with topical therapy, or in this case, using um, topical tacrolimus for managing uh, lip involvement. And, you know, I, I would hope that even to non-clinician eyes, you can see there's really a significant difference in the, in the before and after. So this is without any change in systemic treatment, without any, any injections or anything like that. Um, so the, really the only potential complication that we encounter with treating uh, the mucosal disease, uh, with topical steroids in particular, is the risk of developing what's developing a yeast infection in the mouth. I'm going to talk about infections in the next couple slides, but this is a really nice example where this is a patient who is diligently using their topical treatment and came back and, you know, felt a little bit better, but also noted that the, some, you know, things were a little, still, still kind of uncomfortable and noticed some other little changes. And I'm not showing you a before and after, but I can tell you that in this case, the mouth overall looked better but you see this area here, these areas here and here, where it looks much different than here, which is the typical graffer's host disease changes. And instead you see what looks like, um, we oftentimes describe it as like a cottage cheese-like appearance, or it's just sort of like this like, you know, splattered um, accumulation of these generally white plaques. Um, 
very typical for how uh, yeast infection appears. And we'll talk about treating that in just a minute. But when we use a topical steroid in the mouth, it basically suppresses the local immune system locally. And for somebody who's otherwise susceptible, it basically allows a yeast infection to develop. So we can treat the yeast infection very effectively with either topical or systemic treatment and still treat the mouth. It's just a matter of being aware that this is something that could happen. So the infections that we can encounter are candidiasis, which is a yeast infection. Um, it can obviously affect other parts of the body, um, but very common in the mouth, and in particular related to the use of topical treatment, overall level of immunosuppression. Um, a dry mouth can also contribute significantly um, because the saliva plays an important role in sort of controlling various aspects of um, infection risk in the mouth. And actually, if anyone, if anyone has a removable um, full or partial denture, a denture can also potentially act, act as a sort of a risk factor. So it's really important that the denture is um, really well cleaned and disinfected, or that can be contributing. Um, antifungal therapy, again, topical and systemic can work well. I generally favor systemic therapy only because unless there's a reason we absolutely have to avoid it, it does tend to be more effective, um, and it tends to be just easier to be compliant with. Um, so we might initially treat somebody with, you know, a daily course for seven days or ten days, but if that infection just keeps coming back, oftentimes with just once a week or twice a week dosing with fluconazole, so just a single pill once a week or twice a week, that can actually prevent the infection from coming back. And that tends to be a much easier regimen to keep up with than a topical that needs to be applied, you know, four or six times a day. Um, with herpes simplex virus recrudescence, this is a viral infection. Um, you know, most people are familiar with herpes causing cold sores around the lips, but they can actually uh, commonly occur inside the mouth in patients after transplant. Um, and really, you know, any patients that I see in my practice that are really significantly immunosuppressed or immunocompromised. Um, and sometimes, so, so the primary driver of risk for recrudescence of HSV infection is just general immunosuppression. So it's not the amount of graft-versus-host disease in the mouth or how aggressively we're using topical steroids. It really doesn't have any impact. It's just a, it's a, it's a general um, risk factor. Um, but we can see what are called breakthrough infections, and breakthrough means simply that you know, the patient's taking their antiviral prophylaxis, so if it's, you know, 400 milligrams twice a day or three times a day of acyclovir, been taking it regularly, and then just for whatever reason, you know, the, the lesions break out. Um, and treatment is, you know, generally effective with antiviral therapy. So even if someone's already been taking their acyclovir, we generally switch to valacyclovir and we go to a higher dose, and that will generally get it under control. And then at some period of time, you know, we'll try sort of stepping back to the, to the prophylactic regimen. Very rarely, you know, these are more complicated cases, but it's not even worth getting into that. So this is another example of candidiasis. You know, you're experts on that from the, last, from the last image. And this is an example of a patient who's developed um, uh, HSV recrudescence. And I think the, probably the most important thing to be aware of with this is, especially if, if you or, you know, whoever you're, you're here with, um, has graft versus host disease in the mouth, and even if there have been areas with the ulcerations, but they're, you know, they tend to be in the same place, they, maybe they come and go a little bit, um, and symptoms have been fairly stable, and then all of a sudden, you know, some small ulcers develop somewhere that just seem to be much, much, much more painful than what the graft versus host disease symptoms were, you know, that should raise an alarm that this is potentially what's going on. And you can see it's not always so simple. So here's a patient that I've been following, again, you know, with persistent graft versus host disease for many years. So these are, there's changes on the tongue that are absolutely consistent with long-standing graft versus host disease, but then developed these little punctate ulcers you can see here and here, very round, very focal, also inside the mouth along the inner part of the lip without the typical red and white changes, you know, just this very focal sort of irregular ulceration. Very, very painful. Um, and we can confirm this with culture or some other tests, but we typically just start treatment regardless. Salivary gland disease, um, we've talked about a bit. Um, without going into detail, and you know, you have this handout so you can, you can read as much or as little about this as you like. But understanding sort of the, the importance and the various functions of saliva, 
um, really sort of points to the problems that, to, that potentially develop when we don't have enough saliva or the quality of the saliva becomes compromised. And so saliva plays all these critical, critical roles in addition to the things that we're aware of. Also, you know, has antimicrobial activity, has these feet, these, these um, qualities for, that are called buffering and remineral, remineralization. So the teeth, to some extent, are in this constant flux of sort of breakdown and building back up um, on the outer surface. And the saliva plays an important role in sort of constantly sort of providing that remineralization. So you can imagine like anything, you, you affect one side of an equation and things tend to tip the other direction. Um, and really the, the, from, a, from a health you know, standpoint, what can be really problematic is when dental cavities start to, to develop, and especially when they develop rapidly. Um, sometimes, you know, before we can get, get it sort of ahead of them. And then also, like I talked about before, this risk of recurrent yeast infections based on salivary changes. And so this is the type of pattern that we can see. Um, this is a patient who developed sort of these early changes, and you can see along the gum line, it has this sort of white frosty appearance, and that's, that's, that's demineralization of the teeth. And over a period of time, you can see that this demineralization actually turns into cavities. Um, they have these sort of yellowish, um, sometimes brownish appearance. Um, and in this patient, you can see, you know, also this patient had active mucosal graft host disease, just mostly redness in this case. Here you can see the typical white, little bit of red changes. And again, this pattern of affecting, you know, the teeth along the gum line because you don't have the normal sort of cleansing. So after eating, little food particles basically stay in that area. And that's what the bacteria sort of utilize to eventually um, make, cause the changes that lead to cavities. So there's a number of ways to treat the symptoms of salivary gland graft host disease. There's various saliva substitutes, stimulants, over-the-counter products, you know, all sorts of things that you can experiment with. There's also prescription medication um, we call sialagog therapy, like pilocarpine or civimeline. These are actually prescription medication um, that can help the salivary glands produce more saliva. It's not immunosuppressive and it doesn't interfere with any of the immunosuppressive medications. There's the importance of um, prevention of, of dental cavities. So, I mean, everyone in the population should be brushing and flossing, but obviously in this case it's really important that there's regular brushing, especially after meals whenever possible, flossing at least once a day, um, avoiding sort of, you know, foods that are potentially what we call cariogenic, like, um, you know, sugar drinks, um, a lot of, you know, sticky, sugary type foods, you know, things that are just potentially going to stick around in the teeth, provide the sugars that the bacteria use to eventually cause cavities. Um, we have uh, fluoride, so uh, prescription fluoride that um, you can actually apply at home. Uh, so patients who are at very high risk, we generally pr have a prescription fluoride that's applied by just basically placing it on the teeth at night before going to sleep. Um, there's prescription, uh, there's fluoride that can be applied in the office. So there's, you know, sort of traditional fluoride treatments. There's something called fluoride varnish as well, where you actually sort of paint this um, very intense uh, a fluoride product onto the teeth. Um, and then there's also something else um, referred to as remineralizing agents. Um, probably not as important as the fluoride, but something that certainly, you know, can be incorporated into, um, into management when the, when the, when somebody's at very high risk. It can be a lot of work, and so at the same time, you know, we try not to make things too, too complicated, but at the same time, you know, if somebody's already presenting with, you know, cavities like this, even if we can get them well restored, ideally without having to extract any teeth, you know, we know that that person's going to be at very high risk, so to some extent you do have to um, implement these types of measures. Seeing a dentist regularly is also really important. You know, you can't expect that everyone's just going to diagnose and figure out what to do here. Um, and oftentimes these are cavities that you can't see so obviously clinically, or that what you see clinically is only part of what's going on. And that's because the, the area in between the teeth, or what we call the inner proximal region, you know, we need x-rays to be able to see some of these changes. So, you know, we don't want to see this in, in an x-ray like this, but all these dark areas in between the teeth, these much larger areas like here, Unfortunately, in this case, this is a tooth that clearly would need to be extracted just from the image on the radiograph. But this is the kind of pattern, pattern that we can see. Um, 
if there's cavities, they should be treated. You know, we don't want to just leave them because they can progress much more rapidly than in other patients. Um, and we already talked about antifungal medication. Last piece, um, and again, I don't have a whole lot to talk about this. Fortunately, it's not very common, and I don't want anyone in this room assuming that you're not already experiencing this, thinking that this is going to be the end result if I have graft-versus-host disease in the mouth. But when the sclerotic form develops, it can cause significant problems with mouth opening. And it can happen in a few different ways. Um, the most traditional, traditional way we would think of is when there's that you know, tightening and fibrosis of the skin, and it ends up affecting this part of the body and sort of secondarily affects the mouth just because the face becomes so you know, tight. Um, but it can also happen inside the mouth where there's actually no fibrosis at all. So somebody may have complete mobility everywhere else, but as, an, as a, as a long-term result of the inflammation in the mouth, and again, why this happens in some people and not others, you can get scarring to form, and especially in the back part of the cheek, and especially if there have been long-standing ulcers. And so what you see in this image are these scar bands, and this patient is, has limitations in their opening. I mean, they can obviously open widely enough from a functional standpoint, but they have tightness because these areas that used to be very inflamed have now left behind what almost feels like piano wire, um, and very, very difficult to, to manage. Um, in some cases, we can also see what we call periodontal defects, so areas where there seems to be like really, really excessive recession because of areas where there's not as much flexibility and basically just from normal mouth function, um, there's basically tugging and pulling away of these otherwise very sort of sensitive areas, um, or what we call like loss of vestibules. So if somebody were wearing full upper and lower dentures, they may actually have difficulty wearing the dentures because the, the amount of that sort of what we call like, like the gutter space becomes less and less, and you actually need that space for a denture to be able to sit. Um, there can be pain in association with this, but in most cases it's not really pain. It's usually the problem is more having to do with function um, and just, you know, dealing with sort of, you know, daily activities. And management, I don't want to go into too much detail, but, you know, if somebody had specific questions, I'd be happy to, to, to discuss, um, you know, afterwards. But there are physical therapy type approaches that can be done that certainly have the potential to help for some patients. Um, and rarely we even think about potential surgical uh, interventions, but again, um, you know, there's, there's just, uh, the outcomes are so variable that it's not something that I typically want to start thinking about up front. Last thing to talk about briefly is just the fact, again, I mentioned that this risk of secondary cancers, unfortunately, tends to develop sort of a few years after transplant, but then that solid black line that's for solid tumors, as far as we know, it basically just keeps going up. So the longer anyone lives, great, but unfortunately it's, it's not so different for, I mean, me. You know, the, I mean, the longer I live, there's greater likelihood of something bad happening. Um, but in this case, it's a very specific you know, complication. And, and I think, as I mentioned before, the skin and the mouth are the two most common sites. Um, obviously, my focus is on the mouth. And the important thing is just is just recognizing that that risk is there, so that you know you don't potentially um, you know have something going on and you just sort of keep rationalizing. Yeah, it's just the graft versus disease, which unfortunately we see this happen sometimes. So, you know, you're all experts in graft versus disease now. You've looked at a lot of pictures. You know at least what some of your mouths look like, and you know in all of these cases there's something abnormal going on. You know here there's this sort of cleft-like ulcer, it doesn't look very clean, it's really well-defined, there's no other changes around it. You know, here there's just this funny sort of mass of, of white changes, really doesn't look, and there's nothing else surrounding it. Here there's this sort of red and white speckled growth um, arising from the, from the gingiva, and, and really you, you can't even really sort of appreciate sort of where it starts and stops. Similarly here there's sort of this, you know, deep penetrating ulcer incredibly painful, but also with this mass, you know, it's, it's firm, almost like rock hard. Um, again, you know, you don't want to let something like this get to the point where, you know, you've been trying to figure out for the last six months, like, why something isn't getting better, because that six months really does make a difference. Um, it's not to say that, you know, if we diagnose every one of these cancers the day it developed, that, you know, we can change everybody's outcome, but there's no question that diagnosing these earlier um, and getting the treatment that, that it needs earlier 
you know, will contribute to better outcomes. So um, this is a summary slide and then we'll have uh, time for some questions. So again, graphers host disease in the mouth, it's common. Maybe the initial site of GVHD and it may persist for months if not years after it first presents. Uh, oral sensitivity and dry mouth are the most common symptoms. Not the only, but by far the most common symptoms. Um, management in large part is actually going to be driven by the symptoms, the type of symptoms, the intensity of the symptoms. But, you know, basic management, we talked about, you know, avoiding irritating foods and drinks, um, finding a toothpaste that is tolerable, generally any children's toothpaste, the use of topical, what we call immunomodulatory agents like corticosteroids and tacrolimus, um, in particular for the mucosal disease, and then the various salivary stimulants, moisturizing agents and prescriptions and fluoride for managing the salivary gland disease. Um, the importance of routine dental care, so you shouldn't be running away from the dentist, you should be going to the dentist. Um, importance of getting dental radiographs, don't be worried about radiation from dental radiographs, it's nothing compared with what we all get exposed to on a daily basis. Um, good preventive care and being aware of the risk of cancer. So I'm not going to go through these next slides, but just to sort of orient you because you have these in your handouts. This is sort of just a summary of common prescriptions for mucosal disease and some of the best practices we talked about. This is common prescriptions for salivary gland disease and again sort of common, um, you know, best practices. This is, a, um, this is a table that just summarizes guidelines for screening and prevention and management of late complications. So um, again, all things we've talked about. And then this is a slide that um, just, you know, makes you aware of various other resources that are available through BMT InfoNet, but also through other organizations. So I'll stop there. We have at least 15 minutes. I know I didn't leave 30 minutes, but I'm happy to speak with you guys afterwards or if you have questions during lunch. So questions, yeah. Clotrimazole Cl 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 atrocious. Yeah, the little things to suck on instead, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so um, his question, the, the question started out that um, he, this individual was saying that he's using a mix of dexamethasone solution and nystatin solution, which is actually quite common. So what I, what I don't know yet, but I'll just bring up is it, it's, it's common that this is just given as an upfront sort of prophylaxis, the idea of combining nystatin together with dexamethasone because somebody may be at risk for developing yeast infection. So whether you developed a yeast infection in the past or not, but um, so it may or may not be essential, but it's, it doesn't do harm. And clotrimazole troches will also effectively work as a you know, preventive agent. Yeah, so they're, so, so without getting overly technical, they have different mechanisms of action, which is actually a good thing because in some cases when we're dealing with really difficult, I mean, this is not what we're talking about right now, but when we're dealing with really difficult to treat yeast infections, sometimes we actually use that to our advantage of using two different topical agents, potentially even with systemic therapy, because they're basically, you know, approaching the condition from two different directions. Um, but I'd say from a patient standpoint and for a prophylaxis, for, for a topical prophylaxis for oral candidiasis, whether it's nystatin or clotrimazole really shouldn't make a difference. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, so, right, right. So, I th so the idea, again, of mixing them together is sort of that, like, how do you lower the bar in any way possible? Because it's not just your mouth. You may have, and I got to do this for my skin, I have to do this for my eyes, I've got to take these other medications because of my blood pressure, and, you know, it, it becomes a, a really complicated daily regimen. So, in that case, they're just trying to make it easier for you. Um, it's just a matter of however many times a day they want you doing it. So, if you haven't had an infection, probably one or two times a day would be sufficient, even if you're being told to do it four to six times a day with atrocious. But what time of the day, it really doesn't matter. It's just that it's getting that, that exposure at some point. Yep. Yep, you have a question. With um, the um, probazole versus dexamethasone and things like that, <clears throat> does it matter which one you're on? Like the dexamethasone doesn't work, but the probazole does? Is that, is that an indicator that things are worse for you? No. Yeah. 
So, so, the, so the question was if somebody were being treated with dexamethasone versus clobetazole solutions, and if they respond or don't respond, you know, what does that potentially tell us about the underlying disease or prognosis or anything? And the short answer is, is nothing. And despite the fact that coming from an expert, you know, I will put someone on clobetazole because it's, it's a more potent topical steroid and should be more effective both in my graft-first-host disease population, patient population, as well as other patients I see, you know, outside of oncology. Um, I absolutely have patients that start on clobetazole, and they tell me it makes their mouth worse. And then they go back to dexamethasone, and they, and they think it's better. And I don't know what to make of it, and I just leave it at that. I, who knows? Maybe they do have some weird, you know, unexpected response. Yep. What other questions? Yeah. I have two. Okay. Start with one. So it's a really good question. I didn't. I didn't mention. So the question was: Are there any potential concerns with long-term use of dexamethasone, or I would say, you know, for any topical steroid in the mouth? As far as we know, short answer is no. So um, we see very little, if any, systemic uptake from topical use in the mouth. There's, you know few and far between cases that are sort of outliers like you could imagine, but for the most part, we just don't see it. Even somebody who's not on systemic immunosuppression, you know, we don't see that there's systemic effects of being on a steroid by using even, you know, four times a day for five minutes indefinitely. Um, and some of those problems that you potentially either have heard about or I even mentioned, you know, the problems with, with, with steroids in the skin, um, we don't see it in the mouth. So it's not to say that potentially there's some degree of change, maybe some thinning of the mucosa in some areas over long periods of time. But even if that happens, it's nothing that we see that actually leads to any kind of problem, if that makes sense. So, um, so, we, so we never hold back on the use of topical steroids because we're concerned about the effects of, you know, intensive use or of long-term use. And then you have a second question. Well, yeah, yeah. So the question, so 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 she had a question that's, um, you know, that in the last couple of years there's been somewhat of a rapid decline in her dental health, uh, and it's been advised perhaps to have all teeth extracted and perhaps to have implants placed. And the question was, you know, from from just an overall sort of stress and health standpoint, um, you know, would that be acceptable? So I guess the short answer is. Um, first, you know, really make sure that um, a really drastic treatment plan is essential versus potentially sort of picking and choosing, you know, where the problems are and just extracting select teeth but preserving other teeth because that might be an option. Again, I don't know and I'm, you know, I haven't looked at, you know, radiographs in your mouth. But sometimes, especially for someone who hasn't worked with more complex patients like this, um, you know, not a little bit of noise, but even a significant amount of noise sort of leads to a bigger reaction than is necessarily warranted. Um, and in particular, if you haven't been having any symptoms, you're not in any pain, um, you're overall functioning well. I mean, these are all considerations that I would be thinking about and sort of advising someone about a treatment plan. Um, the other thing is, is that even with missing many teeth, if not all the teeth, that um, implants are generally discussed just because it's, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, that's where dentistry is today. But the reality is, is that implants aren't necessarily a necessity. Um, and for every person, I'm not sure that it's always necessarily the best option. Um, with that being said, there's really nothing specific about having chronic graft versus host disease that would preclude from being able to safely have dental implants placed. Now that's a, it's a, a very short and sort of, you know, focused answer. There's, there's certainly other things that I would think about. For example, 
Um, you know, in some patients, even within the, the graft versus host disease world, there might be higher risk. So if I were speaking to someone with a history of multiple myeloma and they've been on bone strengthening agents, then I would probably advise perhaps against doing implants just because of the potential risk of complications. But even then, it's not a hard, you know, recommendation. So it's a, you know, I can't give you a really, really, like, clear directive answer. But I can say that, you know, they, it can be done safely, but it also may not be absolutely essential and or, you know, the, the, the time frame of how essential it might be, um, you know, might be up for debate. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, there's something called fluoride varnish, and um, I don't think there's any really, like, hard guidelines on how frequently it can be, uh, it can be applied. It's something that, for the, mo for the most part, sort of entered into the dental world for, um, for preventing cavities in high-risk children, but... You know, obviously we can apply in, in any situation. Um, so, you know, for somebody who's at very high risk, it might be reasonable, you know, coming in and having this applied on a monthly basis. I mean, there's, there's no harm. And, and it can actually have a significant impact in um, either reversing or at least arresting, you know, the, the dental decay. So, again, uh, there's a lot of things to consider, but um, even if what clinically looks bad is otherwise functional, and there haven't been any issues with, you know, infections, abscesses, anything like that. Um, there's a lot of things that I might think about, but I do have patients where, you know, we have ideal things that we would like to do, but at the same time, they're so stable that it just doesn't make sense to sort of jump in at that point. So. Sure. Yes, yes. Um, I'm going to go to this corner, not to ignore you, and then I'll talk to you afterwards. Yes. So short answer is it shouldn't be. It just shouldn't be. As long as it's not minty, you go for like the bubblegum flavor or the fruity flavor, um, it will not be uncomfortable. It just, if there's an issue with a toothbrush, then making sure that it's the softest toothbrush you can find, like super, super soft, and even running that under warm water beforehand. But there shouldn't be anything about um, one of those toothpastes that, that causes any sort of discomfort. It's usually the uh, combination of either the flavoring or the, the cleansing detergent. Thank you all very much. I appreciate you coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here.